Uh, and now we're going to look at programs with a uh, with wider focuses. So when we talk about preventing drug use and abuse, there are three basic ways that we can approach it. We can uh, reduce the supply of drugs that are available. Uh, we can reduce the demand for drugs, or we can reduce the harm generated by the drugs. Uh, and there are programs in the United States currently that work on all three components of those approaches. Um, Barry McCaffrey, who is one of the former drug czars in here in the United States, um, is quoted as saying this, reducing and stopping drug use requires fundamental changes in the attitudes of millions of Americans, and that shift in attitude is more gradual than we would wish. So um, when we talk about that, the drug war, the just say no campaign, uh, that general approach uh, is talking about changing a wide variety of social norms that hasn't been terribly effective. Uh, but these three basic principles, reducing the supply, reducing the demand, reducing the harm, any successful prevention program is going to have to focus on one. So when we talk about effective programs, uh, this is what the research tells us. Programs that are effective at preventing drug use and abuse uh, should include medical therapy, fed, excuse me, medical therapy for withdrawal symptoms and anti-craving drugs. We have physical effects that affect, that affect drug users coming off of habitual drug use, uh, and being able to uh, give them medical therapy will help us to be more effective. Uh, desensitization to prevent relapse among drug users, uh, providing clean and sober recreational outlets for former users, uh, and then mental health follow-up services. Um, the presence of the dual diagnosis, substance abuse disorders and mental health problems, is extremely high in the United States. So if we try to treat the substance abuse disorder, uh, often we find that the root of it is a mental health disorder. So providing those mental health follow-up services um, to treat the underlying problems is an effective uh, and important part of an effective program. Uh, extended family services, drug users and abusers do not exist in a vacuum. Uh, so being able to help their, uh, their social support system as well. And then finally, um, that uh, emerging cultural disapproval of drug use. So we see different um, attitudes on different drugs changing in different directions in the United States. So that uh, cultural disapproval is something that's definitely an emerging area. So uh, we, when we talk about drug use prevention, uh, we're talking about a comprehensive problem. Um, we're talking about a problem with a complex web of causation uh, and a number of complex tools required to fight it. So my question for you is whether you've seen many of these programs that work here in the United States. Uh, there may be a few of you who've encountered these, but the reality is that there are just not many that are offered. Uh, and it probably has a lot to do with the, uh, the cost that's really, the cost that is um, associated with developing a truly comprehensive program like this. Uh, we do have a few programs that have uh, been um, conducted here in the United States that would fit these categories. Um, uh, some of them are based on that social influence model. Uh, Project Alert is one of these, uh, and this was a teen, uh, this was a project that was focused on teens and was based on data that indicated that uh, this, this, pro this, pro this approach would work with uh, cigarette smokers and marijuana users. Um, so they took the tools that they used for smoking, applied them to marijuana users, and they found that uh, cigarette smokers who went through the program were more likely to quit or smoke at lower rates, that idea of reducing the harm instead of completely eliminating the use, uh, and that initiation and levels of use of marijuana smoking also decreased in that population. So we did see a program, a, a, um, uh, an effective program with Project Alert when it came to smoking. Uh, we also have a program called Life Skills Training, again focusing on that teen population uh, that takes those ideas from the social influence model and deploys them in schools. Uh, resistance skills, normative education, uh, and ties those together with uh, analyzing those media influences and then working on uh, self-management and social skills. So we've seen that this program, uh, based on the, uh, the research base, is effective as well. Other tools that tend to be effective focus on peer networks. Um, so the peer influence approaches, these are based on open discussion among, a children, among children and adolescents. So um, the underlying assumption here, back to the beginning of the lecture, is that the opinions of peers are important to adolescents. Uh, for those of you who have recently been through that age group, uh, you can probably agree with that. So by having open discussion among children or adolescents, hopefully we can um, affect that, uh, the rates of drug use and abuse of children coming out of those programs. And then uh, peer participation programs. So um, what this is, this is connected back to that idea of social capital. Uh, so these types of programs are going to focus on youth in high-risk areas, uh, and they're going to encourage those students to become contributing members of society, 
uh, just give them a different path in life and then see uh, what, how uh, substance use and abuse rates follow because, not because of the focus on substances, but the focus on life skills and activities such as paid community service. So uh, many of these programs, um, although they get a lot of funding and support, uh, we don't have a lot of data yet on whether these are um, truly going to be conclusive um, and uh, effective tools to use to prevent lifetime uh, use and abuse problems, uh, mostly because they're so new that we haven't been able to follow the participants uh, through later life to see if the tools remain effective. Um, another way that programs focus is on um, the parents and the family of the student who's at risk. Uh, we've got basic informational programs. It's going to provide information about alcohol and drug use and their use and effects. Um, and the rationale here is that well-informed parents can teach their children appropriate attitudes and can also recognize potential problems before they become more serious. Uh, and then other kinds of parent and family programs are actually going to focus on family interaction. So if you think about possibly drug use and abuse arising from a dysfunctional family situation, this is going to try to address those family function problems, uh, helping families learn to work as a unit um, and helping improve their communication skills um, and strengthening their knowledge and skills for problem solving. Um, and basically the, um, the risk factor that we're trying to address here is poor family interactions. Um, so when we look at how these um, continue, we've got some additional categories. Uh, parenting skills programs. Um, so we're going to teach parents how to focus on um, communication with their kids, uh, helping them with their decision-making skills, with goal setting and limit setting, setting um, and how and when to say no. How does, what, how does that work and what does it look like? Uh, and then finally, a fourth category of parent support groups. Uh, and many programs will combine um, components of each of these. Uh, so a parent support group um, is going to be a, a continuing effort after that skills training um, to make sure that parents continue to learn um, about those important skills. So if we think about what this actually sounds like, uh, these parent and family programs, um, to a lot of us that basically sounds like raising a healthy child. Um, so as we think about whether we're going to try to adjust the problem with a child as a teenager uh, when they become perhaps a user or abuser, or if we're going to go back and work on parenting and family skills, um, we got to think about what the problem we're addressing actually is. Are we addressing drug use or are we addressing the underlying problem in the family? Uh, now, as helpful as these programs can be, they can be difficult to implement because of the disconnect between the assumptions that the uh, programs are trying to affect and then the goals of many people who fund these types of programs. So um, although they do sound like useful tools, they tend not to get a lot of funding and support uh, because of those types of difficulties. We also see programs that are implemented at a broader community level, uh, and there are so for some important reasons. Um, basically, in many public health situations, the more coordinated our approach is at different levels, the more effective our intervention can be. Um, so we do know that um, drug education in particular and prevention programs can be controversial. Many people see this as a role of parenting uh, and they expect parents to be able to handle this in the home. So this idea of adjusting it as a community can generate some controversy. Uh, when we do see community programs that come together and involve resources such as uh, local media, local businesses, uh, they do tend to be uh, highly effective. Uh, the image on this slide is one from a program that was focused in a Native American community. Uh, and they talked about the role of tobacco in sacred ceremonies. Uh, and the, the particular focus of this culturally sensitive program was not on banning tobacco use altogether, but reserving it for its traditional sacred uses. So you can take a look at that link if it's something that you'd be interested in finding out. Uh, and then we also have a program called Communities Mobilizing for Change on Alcohol. And this is actually a model prevention program that's promoted by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration of the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, so let's take a look at a little bit about how that program works.
Okay, so that's an example of a public service announcement that would come out of a program like that uh, for that communities mobilizing for change on alcohol. And you can see some of the focuses that we talked about throughout our lectures today, uh, where we're looking at the role of community support, uh, the role of social capital, all those influences coming together. And um, again, as with many public health programs, the more levels that we can intervene on, the more successful our programs seem to be. So one additional place where we can intervene uh, is the workplace. Um, and workplaces actually have a, a vested interest in contributing to uh, drug abuse and use prevention programs um, because of the, the cost that drug, um, that substance abuse disorders have for employers. Uh, so um, there's some connection here to federal funding. If a company or an organization connect, can, uh, receives any kind of federal funding um, from any federal agency, then they have to adop, adopt a drug-free workplace plan. Um, now this can mean lots of things, but the most con consistent feature for these workplace programs is random drug testing, usually through urine screening. Um, and again, we're back to that goal that we talked about early in the lectures about preventing drug use by making it clear that it's not condoned, that same idea that we use with drug-free schools. So, in terms of effective tools to uh, combat drug use and abuse, substance abuse disorders, um, it, it varies by situation. So, what we need to do in a situation really depends on what our motivations are for doing it. So, one example would be a state requirement for drug education. Depending on our goals and motivations, um, we might be looking here at a balanced combination of factual information, not that, that totally focused approach on um, scared straight, uh, but factual information about drug use and abuse, and then the social skills training that we've seen to be effective. Uh, and just to avoid providing students with education on substances that they end up being interested in, uh, we're going to try to avoid demonstrating things that we don't want students to do. Another example uh, would be a um, uh, trying to intervene with a, um, a pattern of drug and alcohol use in a local area that we consider an epidemic. Um, so here we might be looking at trying to pull together a community planning effort to address that substance abuse issue on multiple levels. Uh, and then finally, um, we want to avoid those negative approaches that we've seen to be ineffective, um, like implementing the DEER program in a situation like this uh, would probably not be our best tool. So some categories that successful programs share, um, general competency building, increasing self-competence and self-confidence. Uh, if we can get these tools out to children before they're exposed to drug, drugs and alcohol in their community, uh, they tend to use those substances at lower rates. Um, coping and resistance skills. And this goes back to some of those ideas that we talked about in terms of parent and family interventions. Parenting classes, anger management for the students and for the parents, relaxation techniques, uh, and then this idea of inoculation, a more realistic approach than just saying no. Uh, we're going to help you to address your larger situation in terms of peer pressure, social influences. Um, we're going to practice saying no. Uh, we're going to inoculate you so that you're prepared when that first um, instance comes about where someone offers you a substance and asks if you want to use it. Um, now, we talked about risk factors early in class, so if we're really going to be effective at addressing drug use and abuse in children, um, we need to start with those risk factors. So if we see a student who ex is exhibiting aggressive tendencies early in life, start with that. Uh, poverty is definitely an influence, uh, and especially its role in leading to a lack of parental supervision. What can we do to address those kinds of problems? Um, and then support systems for folks who are uh, early in their drug use. Um, this isn't just children, so this isn't just about programs in high schools or possibly even middle schools. Uh, these should be services that are available throughout life, and they should be sympathetic resources. We've talked about this quite a bit in the discussion forum, so not necessarily punishment for people who are in this situation, but access to treatment. Um, now, if we think about the way that these messages work, um, they're not as exciting as some of the, um, you know, our, our, our rap from the LA Lakers or our Just Say No campaign or This Is Your Brain on Drugs, uh, but these are the ones that are effective. These scare tactics that we put out there in uh, school programs and in media, they're rarely effective. And they, again, tend to help the children who are already at their lowest levels of risk and not the ones that are truly at risk for becoming lifetime users and abusers. Uh, we also don't have a one size a fits all approach to this. Uh, we talked about the role of tobacco in sacred ceremonies in Native American culture. Uh, so this isn't something that is going to apply in a community that doesn't have that kind of background. So our most effective approaches are targeted to a specific audience and address the, the they're culturally relevant to the people who are, who are trying to help. 
Um, and we got to be accurate and honest about drug use. You know, for a lot of people, what we're dealing with is the fact that drug use feels good while you're doing it and helps to solve the problem that you're trying to address while you're doing it. it definitely alters your reality if that's what you're trying to fix. Now, we know that the consequences down the road are going to make that reality worse. But how can we help people who are in that situation to generate that feeling of life improving in healthier ways? Um, now, preaching and judging at our drug users and abusers is definitely something that's not effective. The church lady doesn't really have a role here. Um, for many, many people who are in this situation, this is not a problem about lack of information. Um, this is a problem with a complex web of causation that needs a complex, a, um, a, a complex uh, treatment solution. Uh, and then, of course, to make this truly effective, we need to be applying generous levels of funding. Uh, not our current situation, but we expect in the field that if we're able to use these kinds of interventions, uh, which have helped in local areas on a broader basis, uh, that we'd expect to see true change in the rates of uh, substance use and abuse disorders in our communities. So wrapping up our series of lectures here on prevention, um, a couple of important points. The first one is when we talk about a prevention effort, one of the first questions that we need to answer is what are we trying to prevent? Are we aiming for that totally drug-free society? Does that drug-free society exclude the use of pharmaceuticals? Does it exclude the use of alcohol in all populations? Or are we talking about a different kind of drug, something that we would consider dangerous? And then what are the implications in different communities about what might be considered dangerous? We talked about our different kinds of prevention. We talked about the traditional public health mo model and then the continuum of care. Uh, and then we went through some prevention programs that have been deployed in schools. The earliest one, the Just Say No campaign, um, our most effective one according to the evidence base, the social influence model, and then the DARE program in addition to some others. DARE, of course, being our most widely implemented and unfortunately mostly ineffective program here in the United States. And then we reviewed some peer programs, some parent programs, and some community approaches to preventing drug use and abuse. So this will wrap up our lectures on drug use prevention, uh, and we will be back in touch shortly for our next lecture topic.